On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Tesla releases its production and delivery numbers for the first quarter of 2024. So, were all of the demand levers effective? Plus, the Model 3 Ludacris's formal unveiling appears to be imminent. A professional contractor discusses his experience as one of the world's biggest Tesla solar roof installers and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey, joining you alongside a fed, walked, and thus happy Daisy the Boxer. This is Ride the Lightning, episode 453 for April 7th, 2024. However, I'm not recording it on April 7th. I mean, I never record it the day it comes out, but I'm recording super early this week because my family and I, as you hear this, are on a spring break trip. So, As always, anything that I happen to miss, I will report and discuss for you on next week's podcast, but I do want to thank all of you very graciously for accepting this crazy early episode of Ride the Lightning so that I could get some time away with my family. And one big thing that I may very well miss the rest of this week is the formal reveal of the Model 3 Ludicrous. Multiple examples of the car were spotted completely uncovered at Tesla's Malibu store at the beginning of the week with pictures posted to social media as proof. Not by Tesla, of course, but by random Tesla fans and Tesla owners that saw these cars and saw what was going on down there, took pictures of it and posted them to social media. So it appears that a YouTuber event is happening there. In fact, it appears it's happening today as I record this, which is similar to what happened for the original 3 Fresh unveiling last fall. The only question now is, when is the embargo? If you're not familiar with an embargo, I deal with them all the time in my day job. Basically, it means you get to you get some information ahead of time, but you can't, you agree to not release it until the company says so. And the idea there is so that everybody can release their coverage at the same time so that, you know, one YouTuber's not super rushing and and getting his or her video up first and scooping everybody else so everybody goes at the same time. So when is that embargo? It might be this week, although if I'm thinking about it as through the lens of my day job, And if they're inviting a bunch of YouTubers to this who are going to be shooting a bunch of video and editing a bunch of video, having the videos go up this week might, this past week meaning, might prove to be a bit of a tough turnaround in order to get a nice, you know, really nicely edited video put together. So if it hasn't already happened by the time you hear this, it's highly likely that it will be this coming week, in which case I will tell you all about it on next week's episode on the regular schedule. Either way, I think it's almost a lock to happen ahead of the next quarterly earnings call for Tesla, which is going to happen on April 23rd. Strangely, that is a Tuesday because uh, Tesla usually does these on Wednesdays. I wonder if maybe Elon's got a rocket launch scheduled for that Wednesday or something like that. But anyway, uh, when it happens... On the earnings call, and again, this will get mentioned. I can guarantee you that they're going to bring this up on both the earnings call and mention it in the shareholder letter. It's going to be something they can... It's a a bit of good news, put it that way, that they can point to uh, instead of the lower-than-expected production and delivery numbers, which I will get to in a little while here. Uh, But to finish up on the Model 3 Ludicrous... If, in fact, the embargo lifts this coming week, then the orders for the car are likely going to start to be taken on the Tesla Design Studio on Tesla.com as soon as that embargo lifts, meaning the first deliveries of the Model 3 Ludicrous probably going to happen in very early May, if I had to guess. Now, as for how the car looks now that we've had an extremely clear look at it. Well, I'll be honest with you. The front end looks sharp. I like it a lot. In my humble opinion, 
It is much sharper up front than the spy video that we got out of Europe a few weeks ago made it look. Now that was, I think, a black colored car, if I remember correctly, black paint. Uh, and it was it was definitely like the video was shot from far away on a phone. This is a car, this was an ultra red Model Three Ludicrous, which number one, that's I mean that's the best color Tesla has. It, it is it is just a stunning color, and the the picture was shot much closer. So it's a really really good look at the car. There are photos of it from all around, all front sides, back. I've got the front pic on my Instagram, DMC underscore Ryan, if you need an easy way to go find it. But uh, I think, the, again, the front of it looks really, really sharp, particularly in the ultra red, but it's going to look good in all the colors. Having the vents cut out to push air to the brakes, because that's the difference between, I mean, I'd already described this back from the European leak a few weeks ago, but but just to go through it again real quick, the difference between the the regular three freshes front end and the Ludacris's front end is that the Ludacris has the vertical air slats in the lower front part of the fascia, which is you know kind of very very similar to how all of the old Model Threes have it as well, and in fact the Model Y still has it right now as well. So that should give you kind of an idea of how it looks, but I do really, the way that Tesla has styled it up there, I think it really adds some sportiness to the front end of the car that it, that it kind of needed it. I think it looks a lot better with it. So stay tuned imminently for more information on this. Um, I will maintain my previous position that the wheels on the Ludacris, I'm not a fan. Now I'll, cast final judgment when I finally see them in person, because you always got to wait till you actually see the thing in real life. But from the pictures, I'm not feeling these wheels. They're very arrowy, <laughs> A-E-R-O dash Y, which I talked about again at the previous leak. So I'm not going to, I don't need to go do, do the whole spiel again, but not feeling the wheels. That's the one aspect of the car that, uh, that I'm not liking. If I were buying this, which I am not currently planning to because of Cybertruck, but uh, if I were after this car, I would want to put my Tesla Zero G wheels that are on my Model 3 now on the car. If the tire widths are the same, which they probably are on the front, but it does remain to be seen whether or not the Ludacris has wider tires in the rear, if it's got a staggered setup. So we'll see about that. But anyway... Moot point there. That that's just what I would do to the car uh, if I if I were picking it up. But anyway, I, I want to just add, throw one other thing out, and I hope this doesn't sound lame or desperate or anything. But if anybody from Tesla is listening, I may not be on YouTube, and maybe just that alone is why I wasn't invited to this. But I really would have loved to have attended it. I mean. To be clear, I don't think I'm owed anything ever from Tesla. I do this podcast of my own accord. I didn't start it to gain favor from Tesla or anything like that. Uh, and and believe me, and I know from my line of work, as you all know, I work in enthusiast media by day. I mean, what I'm doing here on Ride the Lightning is enthusiast media. And what I do by day uh, is also enthusiast media. And I know from doing that for 20 years, entitlement is the worst thing that somebody that's in in enthusiast media can suffer from, if you ask me, my opinion. But I, I, I have been at this podcast for a while. I've been covering Tesla for a long time. And I've also owned a Model 3 performance for literally as long as anyone else has. So, you know, maybe, ne maybe next time, Tesla, maybe next time I could get an invite. I would have loved to have come down and, and uh, driven this car around and been able to come back at the embargo and told all of you about it and compared it to the outgoing Model 3 performance. Anyway, uh, enough about me because that's not what this podcast is about. Let's talk about FSD. I am curious, how are all of you who have eligible cars enjoying your FSD supervised version 12 trial? I'm curious if it's won any of you over and turned any of you into paying customers either via the monthly subscription or if you've decided to outright purchase it or conversely, if it's not 
impressed any of you as well. I'd, I'd love to hear both, any and all perspectives on this. So feel free to call in and let me know. I'll give you the call-in information later on in the podcast. And by the way, if, you, uh, if you're wondering, wait a second, did he, what did he say? Did he say FSD beta or did he say something else? You did hear me correctly. I said something else. I called it FSD supervised because that's what Tesla's calling it now. Tesla has dropped the beta label and is referring to it as FSD parentheses supervised. That is the official designation of it. The three and a half year beta has now seemingly officially concluded and this software is seemingly officially shipped. As such, I wonder if there's any additional revenue that Tesla can recognize recognize now from the folks that paid, well, whatever they paid for it, whether it was twelve thousand or ten or or from earlier on. I mean, I I put in my total eight thousand dollars five years ago. Uh, with it was structured differently then. I paid five thousand for enhanced autopilot in twenty eighteen, which I I would have to imagine Tesla's recognized all of that money on their books. And I paid $3,000 for FSD. And so I wonder if all of that had already been recognized on their books or if they now can actually sort of legally recognize it. Anyway, uh, I do presume that's a topic that we'll hear addressed and or asked about on that upcoming earnings call in just a few weeks. Speaking of FSD... It seems that for now, those of you with newer hardware 4 equipped Teslas are not having your new hardware taken advantage of as of yet. Elon Musk posted on X on this topic saying, quote, hardware 4 will ultimately be better, but all training is for hardware 3 with hardware 4 running in emulation mode, end quote. Well, I wonder what better will mean in this case. The higher resolution cameras, I would think, should allow hardware 4 to more quickly and accurately identify things in its field of vision, thus making quicker and more confident decisions, right? I mean, that's one thing. So I wonder how else it might materially and obviously be different to the end user, because there's certainly going to be back-end stuff that's better for Tesla that helps them develop better software and iterate more quickly, but I wonder how else Hardware 4 might prove to be materially different to the end user. And by different, I'm very much meaning better in this case. Oh, by the way, here's one quick thing that I just missed on last week's podcast. And it is this. Congratulations to Tesla on producing your six millionth vehicle. And as Tesla tipster Sawyer Merritt noted... This is how long it took Tesla to hit each cumulative car production milestone. One million cars took 12 years. Two million cars, so one million to two million, took 15 months. The next million, three million, was reached in 10 months. Four million, seven months later. Five million, six and a half months later. And the six million mark was reached six and a half months after the five million mark was. And so if we extrapolate that out a little bit, we're probably looking at about another six and a half months, maybe a tad less for the next million, for seven million, since Model 3 production is ramping back up after the switch to the 3 fresh. Remember as well, not just that, Tesla is for now only building two of the three Model 3 variants while we wait for that official Model 3 ludicrous announcement that it's going into production and it's available. Although admittedly, the Performance Model 3 was always the smallest slice of the Model 3 production pie. So it's not like the Model 3 ludicrous will add substantially to the counter, but it does It does matter. It does tally. But Cybertruck production is also ramping up, but maybe not in time to counter both the three freshes ramp and also beat the six and a half month mark to the next million on top of that. But still, the seven millionth Tesla should roll off the assembly line around mid-October, if we're just, you know, extrapolating this out. 
The only question is, which factory will it happen at, and which of the five vehicles will the seven millionth vehicle be? Statistically, it's certainly most likely to be a Model Y. The photo of the factory team standing in front of the six millionth car reveals the milestone vehicle to be, yes, you guessed it, a Model Y. But it, of course, could be any of them. Could be any of them. Place your bets if you're curious. Uh, All right. Oh, before I continue, I just want to remind you. So I don't have a lightning round mini episode for Patreon this week, which I'd messaged out to the Patreon backers already, as I'm, again, off with my family on a spring break trip here. But just a friendly reminder, if if you're really enjoying the podcast and you get a lot out of it every week and, and you find it informative and enjoying and enjoyable, I should say, perhaps you will consider a pledge on Patreon, because that is how this podcast is able to continue week in and week out. You can go to patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. There are 90 lightning round mini episodes up there. As soon as you sign on and join at that $10 per month tier or higher, you get access to all 90 of those, plus the new ones that I will do each week, starting when I get back. Uh, The annual pledge is an option as well. If you just want to, if you're like, yes, Ryan, I would like to support you, but I'd rather only just pay once for a year rather than do a monthly thing. You can do that on Patreon. And as a thank you for doing that, I give you a 10% discount if you choose the annual option. And if you just want to try it out, well, you can do that. Patreon has a free seven day trial. So if you, again, go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast, you can sign up for the free seven-day trial, which is the uh, seven-day trial of that $10 per month access tier that gets you early access to each week's episode and gets you those lightning round mini episodes each week on Patreon as well. Okay, the headline story this week which is admittedly a bit less fun than everything I've been talking about so far. Tesla's Q1 production and delivery numbers have been released. Tesla's press release reads this. In the first quarter, we produced over 433,000 vehicles and delivered approximately 387,000 vehicles. We deployed 4,053 megawatt hours of energy storage products in Q1, the highest quarterly deployment yet. Decline in volumes was partially due to the early phase of the production ramp of the updated Model 3 at our Fremont factory and factory shutdowns resulting from shipping diversions caused by the Red Sea conflict and an arson attack at Gigafactory Berlin. So let's look at this. For context... Last quarter, so just going back one quarter to Q4 2023, Tesla had 484,000 deliveries. And looking year over year, Q1 of last year, Q1 2023, had 422,000 deliveries. So 387,000 deliveries in Q1 of this year is a rather notable drop both quarter over quarter which it's a, it's a 20% drop if you're looking at it that way. And year over year, it's an 8% dip. Although production was only down 12% quarter over quarter and a mere 2%, barely at all, year over year. And so, yes, all of the demand levers that Tesla was pulling throughout this quarter were, as we suspected, for a reason. And this admittedly isn't a great result. It's arguably Tesla's most disappointing quarter on a sheer numbers basis in, well, honestly, when I was making my notes, I couldn't even pick out one. Tesla had been on such an insane run every single quarter that I genuinely can't even remember the last time they had a disappointing quarter. And I promise I'm not just being a fanboy saying that. I mean, maybe I am, but I promise it's, I'm coming from a place of sincerity on that somebody that reports on Tesla every single week, every single quarter. I just can't remember the last time they had a disappointing quarter because things have just been on the up and up and up and up, which has been great. But certainly the factors that Tesla themselves pointed to, the ramp of the three fresh in Fremont and the geopolitical events in Europe, 
But the other thing that I think is fair to point to here that Tesla didn't cite, probably if I had to guess, would be because they didn't want to draw attention to it, was the fact that the Model 3 no longer qualifies for the $7,500 federal tax credit, which is a double whammy for Tesla now because, as all of you know, as of this year, it's a point-of-sale credit, so you get the $7,500 right off the price of the car as you drive it off the lot if you meet the income requirements. So I have to imagine that Tesla, being the nimble and very smart company that they are, are doing everything that they possibly can in order for the Model 3 to qualify for that federal tax credit once again. In fact, I will go this far. I would be willing to bet an In-N-Out Burger lunch that by Q4, if not sooner, but by the fourth quarter of this year, Tesla will have figured it out and the Model 3 will be eligible for at least the half credit, the $3,750, if not the full $7,500. You can can mark my words on that here on episode 453. I think it's going to happen. And so we move on to quarter two, which has now begun, which will see the introduction of the aforementioned Model 3 Ludicrous, as I told you about earlier, as well as a continued ramping up of Cybertruck production, which appears to be making excellent progress week over week, just based on the drone flyovers and all the rows and rows of Cybertrucks that keep filling up the outbound lot as quickly as the car carriers can come and take them away to go deliver them to customers. There is plenty of optimism for a bounce back this quarter. All right, I've got one other fun story to tell you about before I get to my little treat that I have for you, since I'm going to be away this week. And it's not directly Tesla related, but it's in the neighborhood. I think all of you will be interested. And that is this Disneyland, which I am a huge fan of. I love the Disney theme parks. I know they're not for everybody, but I love them. Disneyland plans to replace the gas powered cars of the Autopia attraction. Thank you very much to loyal listener and longtime Patreon backer Jared Brown in Seattle for being the first person to send this to me from WDWNT.com, which is a Disney theme park fan like news site. They track all the goings on in the world of Disney theme parks. And they wrote, since opening with Disneyland Park in 1955, Autopia has remained a guest favorite most popular with young kids experiencing driving for the first time, says Disney spokesperson Jessica Good in an email to the Los Angeles Times. And her quote continues, As the industry moves toward alternative fuel sources, we have developed a roadmap to electrify this attraction and are evaluating technology that will enable us to convert from gas engines in the next few years. End quote. Uh, WDWNT writes now, Good did not confirm whether that means the ride will get electric vehicles or possibly hybrids, and I'm going to just interject right here. It's not going to be hybrids. They're going to be electric. Hybrid would be the dumbest thing that Disney could possibly do. Times climate columnist Sammy Roth spoke to Disney legend Bob Gurr before the news was confirmed. Gurr designed Autopia about 70 years ago and is proud of what he and Walt uh, Walt Disney built, but also said, quote, get rid of those god-awful gasoline fumes, end quote. Gurr also told Roth about his vision for a Tomorrowland that would be a hub for stories about renewable energy, public transit, and other sustainable technologies that will help create a better tomorrow, quote, This has to be done with positive urging rather than attacking and criticizing, Gurr said, end quote. At the very least, Gurr thinks Tomorrowland could use brighter colors and more kinetic energy where guests could, quote, hear these whirring sounds like little tiny jets and turbines all over the place and don't smell the fumes, don't hear that racket of the little motor going putt, 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 end quote. Autopia underwent a significant refurbishment in 2016 when Honda became the ride's sponsor. 
It's possible Disney could be planning an electric update for when the sponsorship contract ends or is renewed likely in 2026. So again, thank you to Jared Brown and to WDWNT and the LA Times for scooping that one. Well, I know I talked about how great it would be if Tesla sponsored this ride at Disneyland after I had come back from Disneyland and did a podcast a few years ago. So I'll just say this again, especially now that Tesla has started dipping their toes in the advertising waters. Tesla should sponsor this attraction and use it as a chance to educate Disneyland guests with signs in the queue explaining the benefits of electric vehicles and also dispelling misconceptions while they're at it. Because guess what? You got nothing but time when you're waiting in line and there's there's signage and stuff on the walls to look at. They could absolutely take that as an opportunity to educate people on electrification and EVs, which falls right in line with Tesla's mission. Even better, picture this, the kid-sized EVs on the Autopia track that the kids actually drive could be tiny Teslas. I'm not saying they'd literally be made by Tesla, but they could be they could have Tesla vehicle shells on them. How awesome would it be to see little cyber trucks, little S's, little threes, Y's, and X's roaming around on the Autopia track out there? How cool would that be? Now, it might be a little unlikely as let's just put it this way, the CEO of Tesla has made numerous public statements that would seem to strongly indicate that he's uh, not a fan of Disney, but still, maybe the higher-ups, the rest of the executive team at, at Tesla, could convince said CEO of the bigger benefit here to reaching millions of people every year, particularly kids, at the happiest place on Earth, and if they can do that, perhaps the CEO would sign off on it. Here's hoping that comes to fruition. All right, that's everything I've got for you in what I readily admit is a very shortened week of Tesla news here before I hit the road. But I've got a special treat coming up for you here in just a second. It's an interview with David Silverstein from American Home Contractors. He is one of the largest Tesla solar roof installers in the country. So I wanted to talk to him about his experience So stay tuned for that in just a minute. But before I get to that, I want to remind you that this week's Ride the Lightning is brought to you in part by Accelerate Auto and their X-Care extended warranty policy available for your Tesla. You can get it whatever you want, up to 10 years, up to 125,000 more miles after your factory warranty is up. Tesla themselves does offer an extended warranty policy, but A, you have to purchase it before your existing factory warranty is up, which doesn't help a lot of us at this point, particularly us Model 3 owners. And not only that, Tesla's plan is, there's no flexibility to it. It's a two-year, 25,000-mile coverage plan. X-Care lets you go well past that, but you could also just go a little past that. Mine is a three-year, 40,000-mile extended warranty policy. So whatever you want to do, whatever works for you, go for it. Uh, And X-Care has a $100 deductible, 24-7 roadside assistance, rental reimbursement, and trip interruption coverage, the latter two things Tesla themselves does not offer. And X-Care covers everything that Tesla's own extended warranty does. So check them out. See which plan is right for you. Go to accelerateauto.com slash X-Care. That's X-C-E-L. E-R-A-T-E-A-U-T-O dot com slash X-C-A-R-E. And don't forget to use the discount code LIGHTNING to get $100 off your policy purchase. Okay, coming up next is that interview with David Silverstein. I hope you'll enjoy hearing and learning about Tesla Solar Roof. I learned a lot in this. As you'll as you'll hear, he corrected my misconceptions a couple of times. But that's great. I learned stuff too. So hope you'll enjoy that. But then stick around. There's more Ride the Lightning after that. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Franz von Holzhausen, and you're listening to Ride the Lightning with Ryan McCaffrey, the Tesla unofficial podcast. This week, I am joined by a Ride the Lightning listener. His name is David Silverstein. He is the owner of American Home Contractors. 
They are really big in the Tesla solar roof business, also solar panels, of course, but solar roof stuff specifically. David, welcome. Thanks for having me, Ryan. So you and I had talked offline, uh, talked privately, and your story I just thought was so interesting about how you got into Tesla, how you how you kind of become this the Mid Atlantic's like premier solar roof expert and solar roof installer. So I thought we'd kind of get into this because I know you know the audience knows I don't talk too much about the solar, the energy side of the business, but like I said, when you and I chatted, it just I was I was really interested by by your story, by your background, and by what you're up to. So I, I want to just start with uh, the same place I like to start with a lot of folks that come on the podcast is your Tesla origin story. So how did you first get interested in Tesla, the company? So I was following Tesla probably back in 2017 is when I started getting interested in it. Um, I didn't pull the trigger on getting a vehicle. I thought it was too early, but you know, I started monitoring them, started buying a little bit of stock and started paying attention to the progress. I also saw in 2016, I think a little bit before that, um, Elon debuted the solar shingles or the solar tiles. And, you know, being in the roofing industry, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. But I didn't, you know, I didn't hear anything about the availability or if we could purchase them. So I thought it was just an internal project that Tesla was working on. So I kind of laid low for a while and then in 2019, I decided to seriously consider the Model 3 and I actually placed an order in October of 2019 that was fulfilled in December of 2019 for a 2020 Model 3. Yeah. So that was kind of my entryway into Tesla. And at the same time, I was interested in going solar as well. So have you always been interested in electric cars or has Tesla been the, the kind of gateway drug for you, if you will? Uh, Tesla was the gateway drug. Yeah, for <laughs> yeah sure. me too. <laughs> um. So tell me about kind of the your your business and how, you know, so this the solar roof project comes along, you think it's all right, is this going to be a real thing? Um have you have you and your company put up a ton of solar panel? Like have you been doing more and more just solar panel roof projects in recent years or at least before, you know, up until solar roof came along? No, we're historically a roofing and exterior remodeling contractor. So roofing has always been our bread and butter, and we didn't get involved in solar until 2020. And actually, Tesla helped us get involved with that. Uh, we saw that they were at the International Roofing Expo in February of 2020. They had a booth there, and I thought they might be showcasing their vehicles for some reason. Yeah. So we went over to the booth, and we saw that they were actually highlighting their Tesla solar tiles, their solar roof tiles. And they were signing up certified installers to actually install this product across the country, which I thought was really cool. So we submitted our information, got signed up. Everyone knows, unfortunately, in March of 2020, things got shut down. So everything was kind of on pause for a while. But then back in June of 2020, everything started heating up. Emails started going back and forth. We submitted our information and we're anxiously awaiting access to get, you know, get involved with this, this new product. So that was kind of how we got involved in solar was from the roofing angle. We, were, we weren't installing solar panels or we weren't really aware. Uh, we weren't really involved in solar at all, yeah. quite frankly, until we got involved with Tesla. So the, like, did you watch the, the live stream of the, the solar roof tile unveiling at the, was it the Desperate Housewives set, I think, in, in, uh, at Universal? Like, what, what was it about that? Was it the, the sort of the strength of the tiles or just the idea that you could combine a roof and solar, like what was what kind of drew your interest to it? Well, when that was showcased, you know, I saw some videos. I didn't see it live. And I thought it was kind of interesting, again, from the roofing side of things. But we weren't really involved in solar, and it's just a completely different animal. The yeah. roofing industry and the solar industries are two different industries. Um, you know, roofing is typically a one-day project. Solar is typically, you know, months long with permitting and interconnecting. So we never really had an interest to get involved in solar because we knew the the time frame of the projects was so much longer and something we weren't used to. So when we went to the booth at the IRE and saw Tesla showcasing those tiles, we thought they were really interested. And, you know, the way the tiles are put together with the flashings and everything, it just is a really well-engineered roofing product. So that's what really sparked our interest was the fact that it's an awesome roofing product and it happens yeah. to have solar in it. Now, have you uh, have you put the solar roof tiles on your own home yet? I know you you've, you sent me a link. Your website is just 
blanketed in a beautiful projects. There is some, I'll give you the plug here since here it's AmericanHomeContractors.com and you can click on solar roof and you've got some like drone flyovers. So I'm curious, have you, have you uh, gone all in yourself yet? Uh, and, and then I do want to talk to you after that about, about some of these beautiful projects that you've done. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So my project was one of the first three that we did. So with, with Tesla, when we started getting involved in 2020, we had to do online training. We had to submit our information to be, you know, qualify as a certified installer with them yeah. and a good partner. Uh, we had to do a home training kit. We had to do exercises and it was COVID. So we couldn't go to one of the training facilities, unfortunately. So we had to do everything virtual, which was a little challenging. You know, we didn't have anybody on site to help walk us through. So we did the uh, online training, the on the job training or the um, the home training kit. And then we we filmed ourselves doing these exercises and we sent them over to Tesla for approval. So you know, we had to do a lot leading up to actually installing the projects. And then we also had to get three projects secured so that we could have on the job training yeah. so that a Tesla trainer could come out and show us physically what to do on those first three jobs. My project was one of those first three. It was my job, a good buddy of mine, and his coworkers were the first three projects installed by our company. So that's kind of how we got involved in it. And then the first year in 2020, we only installed five projects. But since then, we've we've installed over a hundred. Wow! In the last few years, yeah. Wow. So uh, I want to ask you about your own uh, your own home, your own project. But actually, first, I want to ask you about. You said your your good buddy was one of them. What do you? What kind of like conversation is that? It's like, hey, hey, good buddy, can I can I rip the roof off your home and put on this brand new product that you know you don't have any experience with yet and you're not quite sure how it's going to work like how's that how good a buddy are we talking about here oh he's a good buddy i've known him <laughs> since preschool <laughs> and he needed a new roof anyways so yeah. i went out he had a roof leak i checked it out and i said hey look you know i think the roof is ready when you are and i think i'm getting a tesla solar roof would you want to join me in getting a tesla solar roof as well so I presented him with the uh, the pricing and the the value and the benefits and all that good stuff. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. He's a big Tesla fan as well. Nice. And yeah, he decided to move forward. And then his coworker actually had um, storm damage. So we got them approved through insurance. And, you know, they had the insurance company paying for a new roof anyways. So I asked them, I said, you know, do you guys want to consider Tesla solar roof? Paul and myself are going in to get a Tesla solar roof. And our company, we need three projects to become a certified installer. Would you consider getting your job done as well? And they said, oh my God, yeah, we love Tesla. We would love to consider that. So I gave them the pricing. I gave them the value and the benefits and all that. And they decided to move forward as well. So there were our first three projects right then and there, right in the summer of 2020. Wow. Fortune kind of smiled upon you for that. That really, like that sounds pretty serendipitous with all, all three of those coming together. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it did. You know, we, we wanted to get involved with Tesla and the fact that we had three projects, you know, mine being one of them was very serendipitous. It was uh, <laughs> it was a good way to fast track getting certified so we didn't have to try to sell these projects over the course of time. And, you know, we can knock these three projects out back to back to back. And then from there, you know, we just kept the snowball rolling. So it was really nice to just kind of get our, our feet wet that way. And and what have you learned having solar te the Tesla solar roof on your own home, and as well as from from the projects of uh, of Paul and and your other the other buddy too? Like, so you know, what what have you kind of learned that maybe you weren't expecting, or or that has exceeded your expectations, or or even like constructive feedback that you might have sent to Tesla, like, hey, maybe for a future version, think about this. Like, I'm I'm curious to hear kind of how how it's gone since you did your own roof. Oh, well, every day I look at the roof and I'm just amazed by the aesthetics of it. I mean, it, it truly is the best roof that money can buy. I mean, it's unbelievable looking. You know, before Tesla solar roof, I always wanted a slate roof. But with a slate roof, you need, you know, a different structure typically on your house. Hmm. You need, you know, different framing components, thicker plywood. But with a Tesla solar roof, you don't need to make any structural modifications usually whatsoever. As long as you have half inch plywood and rafters or trusses, 24 inches on center or 16 inches on center, you're good to go. So that was really nice to know that, you know, we didn't have to make any structural modifications to our houses to accept this product. And again, the looks and the performance have been wonderful. 
You know, I was I was really surprised when we did the design, and I was trying to get the biggest uh, system size possible. You know, I was a little bummed. I wanted to get more on my roof, but I had limited space, yeah. and a lot of my roof is actually facing north. Mm-hmm. But you know, even though in the winter months it's a little bit lower production, which is normal, in the uh, spring, summer, and fall the production is phenomenal. And and the tiles are the solar tiles are heated, correct? So if you're getting snow on the roof, it's going to melt and slide off. Do I have that right? No, they're not heated. They they're heat not heated. up okay. from the sun. Yeah, okay. so they heat up from the sun and the snow just melts off and snow sheds, you know, pretty quickly. Yeah. So you're back uh, to production usually the next day after a snowstorm. And uh, it's, do I have it right? Because I had, I looked into it uh, when we, we were wanting to go solar that everybody listening to this knows that it was a little over a year ago that we actually had our system turned on. So it was maybe a year and a half, something like two years ago where we really got serious about it. I did look at the solar roof and it was, it was just a little uh, too much money for what we it was just out of our budget at the time. But, um, am I remembering right that it's the, the maximum amount of solar tiles is, is 50% of them. Is it every other one? Do I have that right? No, you can, no? Uh, okay, good. you can system size to whatever the utility company allows you to ah, size your okay. system as. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, um, you know, 50% active, 50% inactive or anything like that. No, you can put as many active tiles as you can on your roof. Nice. Um, you know, you're just again, you're just restricted by the utility company at that point. Oh, it's cool stuff. Um, what are some of the hidden costs that people interested in getting the solar roof maybe might not be immediately aware of, if any? Uh, well, with any roofing project, the hidden cost is typically wood replacement. Okay. So we don't know exactly how many sheets of plywood or plank boards or fascia or rake boards that we're going to need to replace, you know, until we actually remove the existing roof. So those are the always those are always the um you know the unforeseen costs that occur in a roofing project. Now if you have a new construction project there shouldn't be any unforeseen costs, you know, right. cuz all that stuff is brand new. So Oh, oh sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, good. Go I was just going to ask you the the opposite the, the optimistic version of that question, are there any hidden benefits to the solar roof that that going into it either maybe you weren't aware of or that customers have found Maybe they've they've talked to you after, like is th- th- something that might not be obvious up front that turned out to be like an awesome side benefit. Uh, I will say, you know, the shedding of snow is 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 a real benefit. You know, when it snows on top of most people's roofs, it stays on there for a while. But with the Tesla solar roof, it sheds off pretty quickly, and it allows you to get back to producing clean electricity the very next day in most cases. So I was pleasantly surprised by that. And again, the aesthetics, you know, the aesthetics, yeah. it's hard to, um, you know, and all the good videos we have and pictures, they don't do it justice. You have to see this product in person to fully understand how truly beautiful it looks and how seamless the, uh, the solar integrates with the roofing materials. It truly is invisible. Yeah. And I'll uh, just just lest anyone think that that David's just here plugging his business. I will <laughs> I will attest to that. There are two solar roof uh, houses that I see on a semi-regular basis, uh, one near my brother-in-law's house and, and another one near where uh, I like to take Daisy for walks. Uh, and and yeah, the, it, it really is like, it's just a very modern but nice looking roof to, to my like layman layman's eyes. So it's, it's a, now are you've, you've been in touch and are in touch with the Tesla solar roof team. Like that initial solar roof event they had a few different styles of of solar roof tile uh that they had shown off H- have you heard anything about if we might get any of those other tile styles anytime soon no when they were debuted in 2016 i think elon did a few different variations but right now you can get any color as long as you want black and <laughs> it's pretty much just a slate look-alike tile yeah it's a flat tile um Right now, you know, eventually there could be other colors or whatnot. But yeah, right now we're just focused on the black color and the slate lookalike tile. What, um, like how much contact do you, do you have either? Because you mentioned just, again, kind of randomly running into the the Tesla solar roof engineers at that at that expo right before COVID hit. And like, do you... Are you able to kind of fire off questions to them or anytime you like? Or have you like what's what's been the communication with Tesla like or or is it just kind of 
you're so locked in with it now. You you just you don't even need to talk to them. Uh, we communicate with Tesla pretty much daily. Oh know, wow! Providing feedback on the the product, logistics, um, a bunch of things. Yeah, we're very tied in with them. Um, you know, we have a great partnership, great relationship with them. You know, they're very supportive. They help us with lead flow. They provide us with opportunities. They help us, you know, with training and support. So yeah, I mean, on, pretty much on a daily basis, we're interfacing back and forth because we're doing a decent amount of projects out there. Yeah. So if there's any questions or concerns that come up, we have Tesla to lean on and, and help us get through those those issues. Oh, that's great to hear. Love that. Mm-hmm. Um, how much of of your business now over since this? You know, it's just been interesting to me when when you and I had initially talked that. And you mentioned at the beginning here that that uh, solar really wasn't even on your radar five years ago, uh, as far as the business goes. And so I'm curious now, like how much how much of American home contractors' business is is solar these days? Uh, Tesla Solar Roof is about I would say 35 to 40 percent of our business at this wow. point. Yeah. That's a lot. I mean, because th- you know, the solar roof. Let's let's be honest. It's it's not cheap, right? It's it's more expensive than a traditional shingle roof. So it's the fact that you must be like, are you are you kind of the guy down in down in the mid Atlantic at this point? Uh, yeah. I mean, we're we're one of the largest certified installers through Tesla Solar Roof out there across the nation. But yeah, we're one of the biggest ones in the mid Atlantic area. Um. But there's a good amount of certified installers coming online. Yeah. Um, every single day. You know, Tesla's signing up new certified installers and they're really going to ramp up and scale this product out and make it more accessible to everybody. And as far as the cost is concerned, you know, it is very comparable to a premium roofing product mm-hmm. with solar on top of it. So like standing seam, clay tile, slate with solar panels on top. Yeah. Tesla Solar Roof actually makes a lot more sense than those alternatives. And and the from your experience, I know is is the longevity. Do you anticipate the Tesla solar roof lasting longer than a than a traditional roof? Yes, especially when you compare it to asphalt. Asphalt typically only lasts twenty to twenty five years, mm-hmm. but you know the Tesla solar roof is warranted for twenty five years, weatherization twenty five years, production warranty, but it should last much longer than that. I mean, it's glass and metal. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is, it's, that is cool. It's, I, I mean, yeah, I can't wait. I hope I'm hoping our next roof can be so like the prices will, as you mentioned, continue to come down and we can go down that road. But, um, yeah, it is neat to see more and more of them pop up. Um, I think you'll see a lot more in the next coming years as well. You know, Matt Farrell from undecided, he did a video recently and he talked about the availability and the price concerns. Um, you know, Tesla solar roof is available in, in everywhere across the country. Yeah. You know, Tesla has a vast network of channel partners, the certified installers through Tesla solar roof, and they also do have some direct operations as well. So pretty much anywhere in the United States, you can get a Tesla solar roof. And the price, like I said, if you compare it to a premium roofing product with solar on top, it's very comparable. And, nice. you know, you don't see a lot of standing seam roofs or slate roofs or clay tile roofs with solar on top. And that's why, you know, you don't see a lot of Tesla solar roofs out there because it is very comparable to those premium products. And a lot of what drives adoption in the roofing industry comes from the contractors themselves. Mm -hmm. So as more and more contractors become certified, they're going to introduce this product to homeowners and more and more people are going to become aware that it exists And they're going to be able to go through the math and the value and the cost and benefits of the product and realize that it's a lot more affordable than most people realize. You know, especially when you take into consideration the 30% Inflation Reduction Act tax credit. And that was my next question. Yeah. Yeah. So you that that is that's got to be good business for you, right? When that that got renewed. And so now that's that's going to be um, a tool in not just your pocket, but obviously the customer's pocket for. For a while, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's not going away anytime soon. And it's, uh, you know, 30% on the entire roof because it's an integrated product. So yeah. once you apply that 30% and you look at it, you know, apples for apples compared to alternatives, it's so much more affordable. And that doesn't take into consideration the savings on your utility bill over the course of 25 plus years, yep. any state or local incentives, um, the home value increase. 
Mm-hmm. You know, Zillow. Well, I that's think, a good thing too. Yeah, absolutely. And you're not taxed on that. It doesn't increase your uh, property taxes. So, I think Zillow says solar panels are about four percent increase in the home value. Nice. Metal roof can be up to six percent. I would argue that Tesla solar roof is probably even more than that. And I would take your word on that for sure. Uh, can you talk about the the other uh, the the closing of the loop part of the equation here, Powerwall? So. What if uh, I imagine you've probably learned a lot about power walls over the last, you know, several years as, as this has become uh, a key part of your business. So uh, have you found that Powerwall is pretty an, an easy sell to your customers as part of the solar roof project? Yes, yes. Our battery attachment rate with Tesla solar roof is close to 90 percent. Wow. The average power wall quantity per project is about three. So yeah, most people that get Tesla solar roof also want to couple it with a battery. And that's what truly makes it a killer product. You know, with the battery, you can go off grid and you can produce, consume, store, discharge all yourself. You're more self-sovereign, you're more energy independent. And, you know, that's something in the equation that a lot of people don't factor in is energy independence and yeah. everyone's time is worth, you know, something different to them. So, you know, if you need to be online 24/7 and you have solar coupled with batteries, like that's extremely important and everyone again values their time differently. So, to me that's very important. Like right now if we lost power, I would be still online with you as Me too. You. Yeah, you me too, too, right? <laughs> so we wouldn't skip a beat. Life would go on. We wouldn't have to reschedule this. And yeah, that's something that it's hard to put a monetary value on it. Yeah, well said. Um, the have you are you starting to install the version three power wall now? I've heard that you know, Tesla said they're they're starting to roll that out. So my house will have the first power wall three that we're gonna install on it coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, I have five power wall two batteries at my house right now. So that's we're a looking lot. <laughs> that is out of a lot of battery backup. It is. It is. You know, I have uh, on my main house, I had three, and on my shed, I had two. Yeah. But since we're going with Powerwall three for my new shed build out, um, it's not compatible with Powerwall two. So I had to just put all five batteries on the house. So it's a little bit of overkill, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're looking we're looking forward to Powerwall three. You know, in most cases. One Powerwall 3 will back up the entire house as opposed to needing two to three Powerwall 2s. So we just see it as a game changer. We're, we're super excited about it. Um, the storage capacity is the same, but the output is a lot more for the Powerwall 3. So yeah, and the installation should be much easier as well since it's got the built-in inverter. Oh, nice. And then uh, are you planning to get a Cybertruck as well by chance? Is that on your shopping list at some point? Yes, I do have a reservation for a Cybertruck. I'm anxiously awaiting it to be fulfilled. But yes, yep. When we built out the the shed extension, we actually put a carport onto the right side of it. Um, so yeah, we have a spot for the cyber truck. We're gonna have the wall connector there, two power wall threes. You know, we might add the expansion packs when they become available uh, later this year. I think August timeframe. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the the cyber truck being underneath the Tesla solar roof and yeah, having the whole ecosystem at my house. And, and the reason I specifically brought that up is because when you mentioned <laughs> put five batteries on your on your main house, uh, plus the cyber truck that that uh, I think it was Drew Baglino from Tesla recently posted that you know the the power share functionality effectively turns the cyber truck into the equivalent of nine extra power walls. So the the if the if uh, there's like an apocalyptic scenario, we're gonna all be hanging out at your house because you're gonna have the equivalent of like 14 power walls plus plus solar generation. You're gonna be the guy, David. You're gonna be the guy. Oh yeah, yeah. I try not <laughs> to let my neighbors know what's going on. They just see the lights are still on when theirs are off when they lose power. But yeah, nine power wall batteries in the uh, cyber truck. That's that's pretty Im- impressive. But you know, a lot of people, you know, th- they think that. You know they'll they'll save by not getting a um, a Powerwall home battery for their house, and they'll just use their vehicle. But you know you're still going to want juice in your vehicle. You're still going to want to be able to drive yeah. around. So I think it is still a good idea to get at least one Powerwall. Well, and I think you, I think maybe you have to. The the Foundation Series. The, this has been a kind of a discussion in the Cybertruck community lately about 
you know, it's the part of the foundation series is is installation of the PowerShare hardware. And I think it needs the gateway that the power wall use, but it might even need a power wall as well. But don't quote me on any of that. You'll you'll probably know better than I will. But but yeah, it's it's nine extra power walls that you can drive to work. <laughs> which is exactly. one, which is a great way. To, I'd never really thought about the Cybertruck that way uh, until until uh, I think, like I said, I think it was Drew Baglino phrased it, and I thought that was awesome. But um, do you find that that the that the guys you work with, both on your crew or at other roofing companies, that are 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 they starting like, or have have they kind of really come around? Like, because you talked about your own story here of of not really thinking much about solar as it pertains to your business. Until you know the solar roof product came along, is it starting to to really normalize and just become um, a, a sort of just normal thing in the in the roofing industry these days? Uh, yeah, it's becoming more normal, and other manufacturers are following Tesla's lead, kind of like in the automotive industry. They're seeing Tesla lead the way, and they're coming out with solar roofing products themselves and trying to sign up contractors to install their products. So yeah, it's become more widespread, more aware in the roofing industry. We just have to work together to build awareness for the general public, you know, because a lot of times people don't ever replace a roof on their house. You know, if they move yeah. every seven years or so, they might right. not have to deal with a roof replacement ever. So we have to be there at the intersection of that person needing a roof and that person also wanting to go solar and being aware that this product exists. So right now, the roofing community is becoming much more aware um, but we still have some work to do and some some ways to go, um, you know. But a lot of the installers, like I said, as more and more contractors come online, more and more people get familiar with the product. They can sell. They can talk about it. Um, more and more people are familiar with installing it. Um, you know, then it'll just, you know, it, it, we need more widespread adoption in the roofing industry before it can really take hold in the open market, in my opinion. And that's good that we're getting more certified installers online so that more and more people become aware and they can, you know, let homeowners know. Because like I said, the yeah. contractors are the ones that really drive the products that people use to replace their roofs. I mean, you mentioned 35% of or so of your business uh, as as Daisy shakes off behind me, if anybody's wondering what that strange sound was. Um, do you Do you foresee that number going up? In the coming years, or I mean, you know, it's it's not that you only do solar roofs. So I'm I'm kind of curious. Like, do you see a continually higher ceiling on this? You know, for your business? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking by the end of this year, more than fifty percent of our business will be Tesla solar roof. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and I that just see cool. that growing. I mean, it's a growing market segment. Solar's been growing for a while, but now you know, solar roofing is going to continue growing, and it's exciting. You know, the asphalt yeah. shingles have become a me too product. And this this new uh, product from Tesla, Tesla Solar Roof, I mean, it's just extremely exciting and it's, you know, really invigorated the team. You know, everyone's really excited to promote it, talk about it, sell it, install it. I mean, it's just it's just very exciting in the roofing industry for sure. Uh you showed me some videos of of some of your the amazing projects that you've done. Um by, you know. My house is certainly probably compared to a lot of homes that that you're working on and just a lot of homes in the mid-Atlantic in general. My house is tiny, so maybe they look extra impressive to me. But I'm curious, what's the biggest solar roof project that you've done so far? However, however you want to quantify it, whether it's system size or square footage or, or what have you. Uh, we do have a very large project in the queue coming online this year. I won't spoil any details, but it'll be probably the largest to date um, solar roof installed. Um, by anyone or just by you? By anyone. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I think that's going to be uh, probably Q2, Q3 of this year. So I'll release those details once that that project is completed and the homeowners, of course, happy and willing to share. Yeah. Um, but I can release the uh, the steepest roof we've done, which I think is the steepest solar roof done to date. Which is a 52 12 pitch, 77 degrees. Wow. So 45 degrees is a 12, you know, a 45 degree angle. Um, that's a 12 12 pitch. So, yeah, this was extremely steep. It was on the Atlantic coast, it was right, right there on the beach. And yeah, all eyes were on that. Tesla actually was uh, <laughs> really impressed that we were able to pull that one off. And I mean, you know, with solar panels, you want them just pointed up at the sky. So, I mean, I know I'm just an idiot that doesn't know anything about, about roofing or solar, but 
like how, how did did you do you have to go with just what is it just the so, the sun facing side gets all the all the tile all the you know solar tiles and the other side's kind of not much with it with it with that steep a roof or like what were the added challenges of that project uh well it faces east and west because the house is right on the coast and it's facing the water okay okay so and you know it's got a mansard very steep slope to it um on the front and back but it also has a shallower slope on the top of it so we installed a lot of the solar tiles on the top of the roof and the bottom skirt and the actual face of it the mansard wall that was 5212 we installed inactive tiles on that so it was still tesla solar roof you know all integrated but the active tiles were strategically placed so that the sun would shine on them more more preferably that's kind of be, that's probably a, a fun part of your job, right? It's almost like a little puzzle of just figuring out where to put the active tiles. Yeah. Yeah. And Tesla helps us with that. You know, when we submit a project to Tesla, their designers get involved and they help us locate the active tiles throughout the roof where it makes the most sense. Um, you know, putting together the stringing into the inverter so that everything is in line. Um, and again, they're, they're super supportive and they're just really smart over there. So, you know, without them, we wouldn't be able to, to pull this off. Oh, that is awesome. Well, uh, before I let you go, I want to want to give you a plug here again. AmericanHomeContractors.com. Uh, if you if you just look look up David's business on Google, you have 4.9 stars on Google, which okay, that's that's about as perfect as it gets on 2,761 Google reviews. So this is not like four people that were all happy. This is a lot of happy customers. So uh, you serve the Mid Atlantic region, Maryland, Virginia, uh, Mid Atlantic. David, how can anybody reach out to you if they've got if they're in that region of the country and and want to reach out with any questions or or inquiries about a potential project? Uh, I think you did a great job of sending them to our website, <clears throat> and I can share a, a YouTube link with you if you're uh, willing to share that in the show notes. Sure, no problem. Yeah, so they can check out our YouTube page, check out our website, reach out through a contact form. We'd be happy to talk about Tesla Solar Roof, even if it's not a market we service. We have friends across the country that are certified installers as well. So we can put somebody in contact with the right certified installer in their area so they can hopefully get Tesla Solar Roof installed by them. Fantastic. David Silverstein from American Home Contractors. Check him out at AmericanHomeContractors.com. David, thanks so much. Appreciate you listening to the podcast as well. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. It was great. Thanks so much to David for taking the time to do that interview. I hope you all enjoyed that. Now I've got time for just a couple of calls in the Ride the Lightning Hotline, but there's two in particular that I really want to play you, so let's do that. First, I'll remind you that if you've got a question, comment, or discussion topic for the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. I welcome and invite you to call in and possibly be featured here on an upcoming episode. There are two easy ways to call in. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, Record your question. Please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible. And then email that to me at my Tesla podcast email address, which is simply teslapodcast at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can take that same 90 second or less question and just call in and leave a message anytime on the Ride the Lightning hotline. It's a toll-free number, and that number is one 888 989-8752. That's one 989 tsla And by the way, if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they are special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. First up this week is Kathy from North Carolina. Hi, Ryan. Kathy from North Carolina. I call in with a safety message. I drive a Model S with the yoke. The horn is not in the center. I have no issue adjusting to the yoke. Um, no problem with maneuverability, finding the turn signals, etc. But about a month ago, someone ran a red light and I never could find the horn. Thankfully, I did find my brakes and stop on time, but 
just makes me think now that Tesla has improved the yoke and put the horn in the center, that they almost should treat it like a recall and just go ahead and contact all owners affected and voluntarily replace these yoke steering wheels with the ones with the horn in the center. Truly is a safety issue. I did not really think that before the incident. Just wonder what you and your lovely listeners think about this. I've heard it mentioned a couple of times on your podcast. Keep up all the good work. Enjoy listening to you each week. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hi, Kathy. I appreciate the call. So, what I have heard, and to be crystal clear here, what I'm about to say should not be taken as gospel. But, what I have heard is that if your Model S or Model X with the original yoke is still under warranty, you can request a replacement to the new version, and Tesla will do that once and only once for you, but hopefully once will be all that's necessary since Tesla has improved the materials to hopefully prevent the peeling issue that I realize is is not specifically what we're talking about here, but that is an issue for a number of of, uh, S and X owners with the yoke. So my recommendation is to submit a service request through your Tesla app requesting a yoke replacement to the new version under warranty, and hopefully your nearest service center will make that happen for you. I can't 100% promise you this will work, but I hope it will. What I can tell you is that a friend of mine who uh, I was having lunch with a couple weekends weekends ago, we were catching up for the first time in a while. He, uh, I mentioned this exact thing to him. I said, well, you can just try this, try asking for it under warranty. And they gave it to him, no problem. Like, And this just happened like a week ago. So again, I can't say it's a universal thing that I, I there's no 100% promise here that it's going to work for everybody, but try it. Try it and hopefully you will get yourself that new yoke with not only the improved materials to prevent any peeling, whether or not you already had any, Kathy, but also to get that horn on the center of the yoke, which is... I agree. It's a safety thing. It's it's just better. It is objectively better to have that horn in the center where we're all used to it being. All right. The other call I wanted to play for you this week is from Pat in Austin. All right. It's Pat in Austin. Just finished listening to the last podcast and you'll probably hear this a lot. I have a 2009 Model X and I have not gotten the latest V12 full self-driving update. And I think a lot of people are in the same situation. I've been an FSD owner since way back when. I only paid $6,000 for it. But I really don't feel like I've gotten my money for it, so I'm really eager to get this new software. I've heard a lot of great things about it. Do you know anything about when the older Model X and S owners will be getting this uh, update? Thanks for a great show. Hey, Pat. Well, it's as if the Tesla team heard you and also others who have voiced respectful concern about this. Tesla's policy guru, Rohan Patel, who I've cited on this podcast before, responded to another legacy S or X owner about this. And Rohan said, quote, while we normally prioritize our paid FSD customers to the extent possible, there is a group of S and X customers In parentheses, he adds about 3% of the total FSD eligible vehicles who have a different hardware, which the autopilot slash AI team is working to validate. We have a rigorous safety validation cycle for every software update, and we are working as hard as possible to ship the latest builds to all customers. We don't want to give false precision on timing until the validation can be completed, but want you to know we are focused on trying to solve this. Many of you have been with us on the FSD journey from the start, and it's super appreciated, end quote. So, Pat, good news. And to anybody else affected that's, uh, that this is relevant to as well, it sounds like Tesla is very much working on it and will hopefully get it out to you soon. Thanks again, Pat. Thanks to everybody that kindly took the time to call in again. I'll get to more calls on next week's show. I promise you that. But in the meantime, you are welcome to call in if you've got something to say, something to ask. Dial me up. I gave you the call-in instructions a little while ago. But Ride the Lightning's not quite over yet. I've got your pro tip of the week and a little bit more coming up next. This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117. You're listening to Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast. 
You know, that Cybertruck looks a lot like a warthog, doesn't it? Master Chief, out. I spoke about the ramping up of Cybertruck production earlier, and purely anecdotally, I'm starting to see more Cybertrucks around my neck of the woods. I spotted two on the same drive on my way home from a dog walk last weekend, which was awesome to see. Hey, how about an entertainment recommendation? I haven't done one of those in a couple weeks. The show is Invincible, and it's back on Prime Video. It's part two of season two. There was a big mid-season break. This one is definitely not family-friendly, but boy, what a fantastic show for adults looking for a great, mature, superhero animated show. It is just fantastic. Uh, this is one of my favorite shows on TV right now. Time for a pro tip of the week. It's from John in New York. Hey, Ryan, this is John from New York, and uh, this is in response to Billy's pro tip on episode 450, March 17th. Uh, his pro tip was to check the tire pressure using voice controls. Uh, you can also tap on the low tire pressure icon, the little orange icon that shows up when you have low tire pressure, and that will bring you directly to the tire pressure page as well. Hope that helps. It does help, John. Thank you for another great shortcut. I love these. I did not know about this one, so I'm happy to learn something new about my car. I'm always happy to uh, add to that knowledge base of all things Tesla that I'm always trying to add to. All right, before I get out of here, let me mention some friends of Ride the Lightning that hopefully can be of use to you sooner or later. AbstractOcean.com has a ton of great aftermarket Tesla accessories from the rear footwell lighting kit, which I definitely recommend for Model Y owners, to the drop-in cup holder stabilizer, to the tempered glass screen protectors, and all sorts of other things. You gotta just go over there and take a look sometime. Click on the car that's yours. So go to abstractocean.com, click on whichever Tesla you have. They also have Rivian accessories as well. Click on your car, browse around, throw anything you like into your online shopping cart, and then when you get to checkout, use the coupon code RTLPODCAST. That's RTLPODCAST, all one word, no spaces. Use that at checkout to get 15% off of your first order. Next is the Snap Plate, which you can get at everyamp.com slash RTL. The Snap Plate and the new Snap Plate Plus, available for 3, Y, X, and S. This is the front license plate bracket I recommend if you want or legally need to have one on your car. It'll snap on and off in seconds, but when it's on, it's secure. And when it's on, you can barely tell anything's there other than obviously your front plate. But the snap plate itself is a really nice, clean, minimalist design, which I'm a big fan of. So remove it maybe for car shows, put it on to avoid tickets while you're parked at a parking meter, remove it again to clean, you know, detail your car at home or if you're going to be sending it through a car wash, put it back on if you're going to be going through uh, toll roads or bridges, that kind of thing. So anyway, I am a fan of the Snap Plate and the Snap Plate Plus, which is the strength optimized version of the Snap Plate. Get yours at everyamp.com slash RTL and use the coupon code. They've uh, started offering this recently. Thank you to Snap Plate. The coupon, the coupon code, pardon me, is RTL. So everyamp.com slash RTL and then use the coupon code RTL once you've got whichever snap plate you like in your online shopping cart. BudgetSafeSolar.com is a solar provider that I definitely recommend keeping on your short list of solar providers to consider. You're going to consider a bunch because it's a huge purchase. So of course, you're not just going to pick one to, and just start and end there. You're going to shop around. You're going to do some homework. And I humbly request and recommend, I should say, that you keep BudgetSafeSolar.com on your short list. They now offer home battery storage like the Tesla Powerwall as well, if you'd like that as part of your installation. So check them out, BudgetSafeSolar.com. And if you do end up proceeding with an installation for your home, business, or both, I humbly ask that you use the referral code RTL. Meanwhile, Immaculate Reflections, an amazing detailer here in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. If you and your car that you love, whether it's your Tesla or maybe it's another car, another fun thing you've got in the garage, 
If you're going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, I definitely recommend stopping by at Immaculate Reflections. Schedule an appointment, schedule some service, whether it's paint correction to get your paint finished looking as good as it possibly can. Maybe it's paint protection film on some or all of the car. Maybe it's ceramic coating, which is basically a 21st century version of car wax that'll last for a good three to five plus years. In fact, mine is over five years old now, so uh, it's doing great. It's been doing great. So Immaculate Reflections, go to the website irdetailing.com. If you do get in touch through the website, be sure to mention that you're a Ride the Lightning listener and the Ride the Lightning listener discount will be kindly extended to you. Finally, my Patreon, which I mentioned a little while ago towards the top of the show, but I'll just real quick mention it again here. Again, the podcast is always free. It always has been, always will be, but it's listener supported. That means I'm able to keep doing this balanced with my full-time job and my family life because of your kindness and generosity and support. And if you feel like this might be the time where you're willing to give that support, I would be humbled and grateful. You can learn more on my Patreon page, which you can find at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And if you're not already following this podcast on your favorite podcast service, that's totally free. That's just a matter of going to Apple Podcasts, which is statistically where most of you get it, and clicking follow. Like, I want to follow this podcast, and that means every time there's a new episode, which as all of you who've been listening for a little while know, is every single Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific, it will come your way automatically because you've followed the podcast on your favorite podcast service. Again, whether that's Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, or on YouTube Podcasts, you can find me on all of those if you just search Ride the Lightning Tesla. That should find me pretty easily. A reminder that you can get your three free months of FSD if you use a referral code when you're a referral link, more specifically, if you're buying a new Tesla. And if you don't have anybody else in your life and just need a referral code, feel free to use mine. The way to do that is to go to ts.la slash Ryan73014 on any web browser, mobile or desktop. That'll take you to the Tesla Design Studio landing page where you can choose an inventory car or a custom new order of either S3, X, or Y. Cybertruck's not eligible quite yet. But if you're purchasing any of those four Teslas and you do so through that referral link that I just gave you, you will get three free months of FSD upon delivery, which I presume is going to be actually four months. Hopefully, they're tacking on that one extra month of free trial that they're they're giving everybody right now. So please use that if it is relevant to you. Finally, you can email me anytime, teslapodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow me on X and or Instagram. I have the same username on both, and that username is DMC underscore Ryan. Finally, I want to say hello and thank you to the Plaid, Maximum Plaid, and Roadster in Space tier backers. Thank you all so much for your continued and very generous support. As one of the thank yous that these tiers get, they get a shout out at the end of each week's episode. They also get invited to the monthly Patreon Zoom Hangout, which is always a great conversation. I just sent out the invites for that. We'll be doing that when I get back. Uh, They also get the lightning round mini episodes every single week and the uh, early access to each week's show as well, which in this particular week, since I'm heading out of town and I'm recording this on a Tuesday night, you're going to get it really early, like crazy, super duper early this week as a, hopefully that's a little thank you from me to you. Anyway, here comes the thank yous that are due to those Plaid, Maximum Plaid, and Roadster in Space Tier backers. I'll start with the Plaid crew. Thanks so much to George Cassioppo, Logan Willis, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla Owners Club of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peake, 
Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia family, Aaron Altshul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Ish, not Elon Musk, Peter, and the Bear Boys of Colorado. Next up, the Maximum Plaid backers who are Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from New York City, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisniewski, Gil Cabrera, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Derek Nesselrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Corey O'Donnell, Aaron, John Cody, Joel Sapp, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, Doug Carey, James Gregory, Adam Lavoy, ContactOneCallCenter.com, Jason Chalukas, Travis Krenzel, Bruce Otterstein, Tom Behan, Josh Pennington, Matt Kalin, John from Cream Ridge, New Jersey, Sean Tisdale, Dustin Hart, Michael Gallo, Derek Finley, Charles, Charles Clement, pardon me, Charles, and Rav. Finally, an extra big thanks to the Roadster in Space tier backers. They get an extra thing on the cherry on top, hopefully. They, they see it that way. And that is a one-on-one -on -one monthly call with me, which a number of them uh, are kind enough to take me up on, and I always enjoy talking to folks. So thanks so much to the Roadster in Space tier backers, Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Iacoveto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, Carol Weston, Robert from Near Philly, Kristen Rumble, American Home Contractors, and GetAmber.com. And that'll do it. This was Ride the Lightning episode 453. Again, I really hope you enjoyed the interview. I had a great time talking to David and just learning stuff about the Tesla solar roof and somebody that has done a million of them uh, professionally. And it's something I've literally gazed at from afar with awe, like, wow, that's amazing. I wish I had that on my house. I'm lucky to have solar, but we, we looked at the solar roof and it was uh, it didn't work out for us. But hopefully you enjoyed that conversation. And hopefully you enjoyed the rest of this week's episode as well. Again, anything I, me I miss, I will, of course, pick up next week. That is, it's highly likely that the official unveiling of the Model 3 Ludacris is going to be, I don't know, if I were, if I were putting money on it, I think it's probably going to be this coming week as you're hearing it. I, I don't think it's going to have already, the embargo will have already lifted by the time you hear this, uh, meaning like by the time this episode publishes on Sunday the, what is it, Sunday the 7th, I think it's, uh, I think it's probably going to be this coming week because like I said, it's, there's a lot that goes into making a good YouTube video and um, apparently people saw Marquez Brownlee there, MKBHD, who hopefully still listens, listens to the podcast. Marquez, hi, if you're listening. Uh, Jason Camisa from Haggerty was there. He's, if you remember Jason, I was raving about his Cybertruck review. He was one of the original three, along with Marquez and Top Gear that had the, the first Cybertruck videos up. So the, the, the who's who were out there and those, those people all produce really incredible videos like high production value stuff. So I suspect that the embargo is going to allow them for some time to create that content in the way that that's going to benefit them and their audience, meaning us the most. So hopefully I won't have missed the Model 3 Ludicrous launch or unveiling, I should say. But whenever it happens, I will be right here for you to talk a whole lot about it because I'm super interested in that car. Can't wait to hear what it can do. But until then, this has been Ride the Lightning episode 453 for a snoozing Daisy the Boxer. I'm Ryan McCaffrey. Thank you all so much for your time, your attention, and your support. And I will see you again next week.
I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make it's it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.